In this episode of TWIP Talks, it's all about 360 video. Hey folks, this is going to be a really interesting discussion because as you may know, I've been sort of putting a toe in the water with regard to 360 video and VR and it's been in the news and on This Week in Photo almost every episode <laughs> for the last couple of episodes. And I want to find out why. So we have someone here who's an expert in that area, 360 video and VR and all that magic stuff. Seems Mark Charette, he's a um, commercial photographer. Mark, where are you based at, by the way? I am actually uh, north of Sydney on the Central Coast. Beautiful, beautiful area in Australia. Expat Canuck, you know, so I haven't oh. shoveled snow in about... You know, what is it, eight years now? <laughs> so, Very cool. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Awesome. Well, welcome welcome to the show, man. Let's dive right into well, this. Thank you for you, having me. You're, you're an expert in this stuff, you know, and you, and, and when I say expert, I mean, you've, you've logged many hours of 360 media capture in your life. Tell, mm -hmm. us, tell us a little bit about that. What, how, what's your pedigree for 360? Well, I'll tell you, it's, it's kind of a funny thing because I, it's, it really came about as a result of doing um, photography in the tourism industry. Mm -hmm. um, I had a lot of clients. I was actually selling and adver advertising and doing photography in the tourism industry. And a buddy of mine actually said, you know, Mark, um, you ever think of going and doing 360 um, uh, photography for Google Street View? And I go, what's that all about? I had no idea what he was talking about. It was quite an interesting idea. He says, yeah, you can actually go and get certified to do this photography program where you can actually do essentially what the Google Street View car does, but you do it inside of businesses. And I thought, man, this is, this is crazy. This is awesome. So I, I, uh, I popped onto um, the little Google request to become a Google Street View photographer uh, link. And it took a little while to go through that process. You don't get that to the top of Google's uh, email chain all that quickly. Uh, but eventually got the uh, email back saying, congrats, you're welcome to the program, did, did a little bit of training, and very quickly uh, was able to get that certification. And from there on, that's, that's literally what I've been doing, is doing 360 virtual tours, primarily on Google Maps. For, or Google this, is, this is your, this is your full-time gig? This is what you yeah. do to pay the market? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah wow. exactly. So let's, let's just like get a little bit deeper on that. So... Many people are familiar with Google Street View, and that's where you can virtually walk around different parts of the world, or if you're visiting, yeah. you know you need to go to this certain business, and you want to get a look at it before you actually mm -hmm. arrive to kind of get a feel mm -hmm. for the area. It's, been, it's wonderful for that. And you're, mm -hmm. the, way you, the way you're describing it is you take it off the streets and inside. So Street View inside of, of businesses. Explain how that works. Well, quite simply, it, it's... It, it's a matter of doing photography using um, um, a DSLR, um, an eight millimeter lens, which is a fisheye lens, mm -hmm. and taking a whole series of images. Obviously, we're all talking to photographers, so they'll all know about the, the whole world of HDR. Yeah. Um, so because of the fact that you're actually shooting in an environment where you're uh, indoors and outdoors at the same time, it's very... It's a, it's a real pain to get the, the, um, you know, the bracketing that you really require. So you actually have to shoot HDR to actually get anything out of these images in some cases. And you're stitching all these images together. And then once they're stitched together, they create what's called an equirectangular image. I love and that word, equirectangular. Uh, yeah. I love that. It's, it just sounds so technical, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. It does. Yeah. Equirectangular. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Or we can short it to equirec. That's sort of the, uh, you know, the in-chat uh, way of saying it. Yeah. Uh, but once you've actually done that, you actually then take all these images and place them on a, a tool, which is called the Google Street View Editor, which then pins each one of the, the images in geolocation within the business. And then you then link each one of them between each other so that you create what's called a virtual tour, which is an interesting point, Frederick, because you know what happens, a lot of people get confused between the world of VR and 360 degree imagery and, and video, and they all actually are, they are using similar technologies, but there are, some, there are some big differences in terms of how they're captured, how they're used, and the vast majority of what I do is actually what's called a virtual tour, mm -hmm. which means that you're actually going from one point to the next to the next using these equi-rectangular images that are seen in a digital format. So that's and really that's, what that And is. that's what we had, I mean, the, it's, it's, it, it, like several years ago, it was remember the remember the rage of QuickTime VR and the promise yeah. of QuickTime VR and sort of yeah. it was nodes if I if I recall correctly where you create yes. a sphere 
or mm -hmm. maybe it wasn't a sphere back then, but it was at least a 360 pano. Mm -hmm. And yeah. within the pano, you could create nodes that you would walk through. So it'd be a pano in the living mm -hmm. room and you could click over there and there'd be a mm -hmm. pano, you know, in the dining room, you could look in there. And then within, if I recall correctly, within those panels, they had the idea of object VR where yes. instead of a 360 outward looking panel, you'd mm -hmm, have a 360 mm -hmm. of, a, of an object. So within there, you mm -hmm. could say, oh, look at that statue and click on that and look at it in 360 and then put it back down exactly. and continue your walk. So is this, exactly. are, we, are we back to that only better? Because now we're, we're kind of, you know, a bubble instead of just a, a strip in 360? <laughs> That's a, that's a very good way to describe it, actually. And in fact, one of the, one of the organizations that creates software that, that allows you to have virtual tours that are not found on Google Maps, because that's not the only place. In fact, there's a lot of people out there who actually prefer not to publish on Google at all. They've got, because obviously what happens is Google is trying to feed um, a, that, that imagery um, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So that means some of the imagery's quality is going to be downgraded, you know, for, and for good reason. But when you when you go to publish this this content in, in another environment, such um, as as of your own website or even offline, if you're looking to have something that's uh, going to be available, even if you don't have an internet connection, um, there's software such as Auto Pano Giga and well, the one that I use, which is Pano Two VR. Um, now, and that's uh, by a company called Garden Gnome, which is uh, quite an. They they do some really cool stuff because they also create the same software you were just talking about, which does the 360 of an object, and that's called Object 2 VR. And again, it's the same thing. Where but what you're doing is you're, you're as your your camera stays still, the product moves, and then you're shooting it in 360 on a turntable. Um, so that's what that software is. Yeah, that's really cool. That's that's really cool. I mean, and then and this stuff is. Yeah, you know, we on this week in photo we talk a lot about these different tangents that photography is taking, whether it's drones or VR or VR photography, VR video. There's 4K, there's 5K, 8K. There's all these different things that are coming that are different ways for us to capture capture information. You know, and like we were saying before we recorded, photons and and the basic physics of what you're capturing have remained the same since the beginning right but That's but now we're finding new ways to synthesize and capture capture mm -hmm. this stuff so okay yeah. so let, let's talk a little bit about the the technique involved with this so mm -hmm. you so be, because this is just this is photography right so Maybe. you can you can create HDR panos if you wanted to, right? Yeah, and, right. And, and bracket that. Have you done something like that before? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like this is, let me, I'll show you my rig. This is actually, all, I'm shooting with a Canon 7D, okay? Which is not like, you know, it's a stock standard 7D and any crop sensor camera will probably do the job. Um, and what, what, actually what's more important is the lens and the mount. That's really the stuff that makes mm -hmm. the big difference. And I'm actually shooting with a Sigma, uh, um, 3.5 mil. Um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm eight millimeter, three point five, yeah. and the mount that's on it, I actually leave permanently on there because it's all I use this thing for. And this is actually uh, built by a company called Tomshot, out of Germany. I, I Tomshot, T O M S. Tomshot, yeah, Tomshot three hundred and sixty is what this thing's called. And what it does is it actually has a, a nodal adjustment on the bottom. You, I don't know if you can hear the click. It's actually a four point click on this over here, and you can actually change the clicking point. And what it does is it makes sure that you're turning at 90 degree turns, and then when you go to stitch all your images, it actually stitches properly. You get the correct level of overlap. Um, and the other thing that it does is it's in a slight angle, uh, which is a seven and a half degree angle in this particular case. And what that does is it helps you clear your tripod so that oh. you actually don't end up having you know, this big problem of a tripod in the, in the, in the image. And usually, you, what most guys do in this industry, the guys and girls out there, what we, we do is we actually will Photoshop the, uh, the floor back in and cover up where the tripod was. Or what you do is you put um, what's called a mirror ball effect, which is one of the features that you can create out of Pan2 VR and some of these other tools. And you're, you're creating basically a spherical image, it's a round image that you just sit on top of yeah. where the tripod was. Uh, and that's called the nadir, or nadir, depending on your pronunciation. I think it's actually nadir is the correct pronunciation for that. Um, so, but that's actually the gear that's used for doing the vast majority of all the 360 photography that's done nowadays. That's really that's yeah. really cool. So, so Mark, take me through the flow. So, mm -hmm. how do, do you, are you 
like how do you get the clients to to go out there do they do they come to you or are you knocking on doors or how do they how do you get how do you get the gig it, it is door knocking primarily the vast majority of my work is a lot there, I'm, I'm getting a lot of referral work now because or in repeat business especially with clients who have multiple locations in fact the location that I, i'm in right now that i'm speaking to you from is a place called the nexus smart hub and i did their virtual tour interesting story on this is i actually i i knew about these people but ha um hadn't actually had a chance to communicate with the right folks and uh, there's a young lady that uh, that man manages this place uh, came to a, a meeting I had a chat with her and I quoted on the job because she says they would, they would really like to, act to actually do a, a virtual tour they thought it'd be a good way for them to market their space it's a place where you can rent an office for a day um, with good high-speed internet and if you know anything about internet in Australia it ain't great so you know. I've heard the rumors, I've You've heard heard the rumors. rumors right? <laughs> So yeah, so I ended up doing this tour two days before the one year anniversary so that it could go and uh, go live and actually show it off to everyone who was coming in for the anniversary party and they were just blown away with this thing. Wow. Um, so that's, so this is, so this is a, a good example of an organization where I've done a virtual tour for them. I've also created something called a custom virtual tour, which we can talk about a little bit later on. Um, I'm, but now they're actually expanding. They're actually putting it under the building next door. So of course I'll be back to finish up the job once this building is finished up. And it's, you know, these are decent size uh, photo shoots. You're talking 35 to 40 nodes. Um, oh, well, you know, oh, so it's yeah. not just one. You're not just nah. going in there and doing four clicks and then you're out of there. You're nah. No, these, wow. these, yeah. In fact, actually the largest uh, photo shoot I've done to date, actually, um, I haven't published all of them as of yet. We're just about to, to go through uh, some really cool technology to, to actually display the uh, the tour. Well, would you believe it? It's actually a lawn um, um, a, a lawn cemetery. <laughs> it's a big property, yeah. and their challenge is that they're actually probably about oh uh, about a hundred kilometers away from from Sydney, and so people don't really want to drive all the way out to to actually check this place out if they want to buy a plot. So they've actually got a sales office back in Sydney where they're going to use the virtual tour to show people around. Wonderful. So it's a fabulous tool for them. Makes you know it's it's cost savings for them. It's uh, you know, and then on top of that, it also helps with um, bad weather. You know, you can still show off a great looking door and, and get people to look around and get a sense of the space, even if the weather's bad in an outdoor environment. So it's not just see inside; it's see inside a private place is probably a better way to put it. Uh, yeah. And that particular tour was I actually shot about 180 spheres to cover that space, wow. which wow. about our, just under 100 are actually published though right now. Wow, that's great. That's great. What a yeah. great gig. Okay, yeah. so so then that that kind of begs the question, what about video? Mm. You know, yeah. so you know you're doing stills which are you know are great for showing a location and and getting that beautiful sort of real estate and a sense of place. Mm. But yep. with, with with video and you know we're seeing streaming video 360s now mm. which which can actually put a person say at a concert or at you know inside a venue or at a funeral or whatever is yeah. that is that is yeah. that on your radar to do that it actually is in fact my, I'm, I'm i'm learning about it now and i'm toying around with something that you're familiar with the, the little, guy yeah you know this thing <laughs> <laughs> it's just the coolest little toy and i gotta i gotta give uh kudos to a guy named john warkington who absolutely pushed me to buy one of these he says mark get one of these things yeah he says this is going to be the most powerful little tool and toy because it's a toy yeah. but Man, if you see the imagery that John's doing with this thing, it'll blow your mind. He's mm -hmm. actually, because what he actually uh, he recently did a photo shoot using um, a Ricoh Theta S hanging out of a helicopter <laughs> on a panel pole, which is a pan uh, uh, basically it's just a great big monopod that he sticks it onto, mm -hmm. overlooking the uh, Perth airport when the Anatov 225 flew in, um, for, which is the world's largest plane, which is why he wanted to do this shoot. Wow. And what's he shooting with? Because you can't go and stick a DSLR out of a flying helicopter. It's just not the right thing to do. Right, but this right. was something he could do. And what? Wow, just amazing some of the stuff. So I, I really encourage people to have a look at John Workington's work. He is just fabulous and, and, and probably one of the better people to talk about where this is actually going. That's, that's great. You know, and, I, and like you said, I do have the Theta S. And it was in myself, like many other people that I know, the Theta S served as sort of the gateway into this world of 360, that's, you know, yeah, yeah. and I think that's good and bad because like you said, it's, it's not, it's not designed as a high end professional level tool. It's more like a point and shoot 
for 360, but it, it still it, it still gets you into that world and you can understand what the possibilities are and it gets the creative juices flowing, right? That's exactly it. In fact, it is really, um, um, you know, it's, again, I, I go back to John because conversations he and I have are always fascinating, I, but he, he pointed it out as being the de democratization of 360 photography. It's really what it, uh, it does, is it opens it up for everyone to actually see what, it's gonna, what it looks like. Um, it also um, does separate the men from the boys in, in that sense because there is a difference in the quality. Uh, totally, and going back yeah. to your question and, and point with regards to the world of, of, of 360 video, uh, you probably have heard that um, GoPro has signed up a deal or bought out a company called Color, uh, which do KR Pano. And their relationship, and I'm, I'm hoping I'm correct, because there's, there's also another company that actually is quite involved in this. Um, and the world of VR 360 uh, for video, that's a, that's a whole different egg, I'll tell you. It really is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, whole, it's completely different, yeah. In fact, it's actually a lot more complicated because you're dealing with a lot more content, and the stitching issues for the imagery is, is a lot more complex. Um, the, the, you know, you're dealing with white balance on the fly. You know, like those yeah. are tough things to do. Um, yeah. So I actually am only putting toe in water with that one. I'm going to stick to what I know well <laughs> right now sure. and, and develop sure. that over time. Um, there's, but there are other little um, niches within that. Uh, one of them that I was actually most fascinated by because it, what it does is it retains the really high level of resolution is where you can embed uh, video content inside of a 360 still image. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And how does that yeah. work? Well, um, when you're actually publishing a 360 image, um, one of the things that the software will do is something called a cube face. What it does is it takes the 360 degree image and then cuts it down into cubes, all right? So that the images are smaller, they're easier to push up to the, to the internet, easier to download and look at. But inside of each one of these cubes, you can put whatever content you want. If you take one of those cubes and say, that cube's got video in it, the rest are just still. You can actually swing around inside of one of these images and then go, hang on, there's something moving in here. So, <laughs> and so somebody will come out and have a chat and, the, you know, and, and show it or do a demo. And because of the way that this is set up, you've got audio included. You can also have a stereophonic effect built into the actual 360. So as you pan back out, the, the audio follows the pan. Yeah, so you can hear it's coming out, it's over there, and it's coming into your, your right ear and vice versa. That's right. Yeah, so that's even if you weren't even looking at the, at the actual video portion of it, if you're just busy looking at something else and the video hasn't loaded yet, if you've got your sound on and you're suddenly in your right ear, you go, hang on, there's birds chirping over here. <laughs> there's something <laughs> going on. Somebody's opened a door or something like that. Then you, you obviously you'll be tempted to turn around and look at that, and then you can actually see the video that's actually playing on the inside. Um, really interesting. By, a fellow by the name of Barney Mayer has actually created a few of those for for some some very some of the um, uh, properties that are sort of the you know, um, what would you call them uh, um, some of the old properties in Australia some of the really aged places um, mm -hmm. more, more of a you know tourist attraction type places and it's sure. just fabulous fabulous that's yeah. that's great I never I never thought about that but it just goes to show there's so many different tangents that you could take to do this kind of thing right so let's exactly. let's do like let's let's mm. let's talk about definitions for a second right so sure. we've been talking about 360 like like with the with Google Street View 360 photography yes. and these are primarily stills currently that's who right. knows what Google's gonna do right but primarily yeah. stills <laughs> primarily stills right now um, and then we talked a little bit about 360 video and then embedded video mm -hmm. in a 360 still right yeah or in a, in a still 360 uh spherical uh mm -hmm. what do you call these see like i'm like my brain is searching for terms so yeah, what is it called? an equirectangular yeah so within the yeah. equi <laughs> rectangular image we are embedding yeah. a video we can embed a video inside the equirectangular still image i feel like That's i'm a right. star trek right now <laughs> Like, yeah. Captain, the, the tachyon emissions are compromising the aft shields, right? So. <laughs> it, it, it does get a little like that. It does. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. almost so, a whole other language. But a lot of, a lot of, the, a lot of the, uh, the confusion that I'm seeing, myself included, is this mismatching of terms that we're seeing, right? So we, say, yes. we see 360 video, and a lot of people are saying 360 VR when it's not actually VR because yeah. VR is virtual reality, and it's more... 3D generated scenes like Second Life, you know, where you're yes. immersed into. Can you help 
kind of demystify yeah. that those phrases? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I I would actually suggest that um, Google actually I think coined it probably the best, and, I, and I'm sus I'm suspecting they're the ones who coined it because I swear I saw it first. Um, but the term for a 360 still image should actually be called a photosphere. Because if that. you think about yes. it, that's a good name. Just yeah. makes sense, right? It's a round image, you know, and it's it's actually full three, 360, and it's got a, a depth to it, but it's still, in fact, really yeah. a 2D yeah, image. Yeah, I think of it as it's a bubble, and you're inside the bubble, you know, and you're looking you around. got it. Right? Yeah. Exactly. So photosphere. As opposed to uh, virtual reality, VR, which goes into the world of where there's an immersion that takes place, usually due to wearing some form of gyro equipment, like a headset, um, like you know, the Oculus Rift is good, the cardboard, which is still mm -hmm. actually pretty impressive. You got one you, back you, there. You got one? Yeah. yeah, exactly. My son, actually, who is a, a software engineer for the Canadian military, actually just bought himself an Oculus Rift just to basically play around. He's a real gamer guy, but he's also really involved in... in, in, in Looking at it from the inside out, so yeah, yeah. So, so that world is, is quite impressive. But that's that's virtual reality, mm -hmm. um, and of course you could add to that that we're you know, is there actually three D content in there? Well, kind of, sort of, but it's not really there yet. I think there's a lot. Yeah. It's you're, you're when you're trying to render things in three dimensional space, um, that's where it gets really complicated. It's a lot um, of horsepower. I mean, like Microsoft, yeah. I forget the name of the product that they have out there, but looking yes. at their page, it's really impressive because it kind of merges, mm. it, it merges VR, like what we're talking about with, with augmented, where you put on these goggles and you actually see around you in real yeah. time, like my desk is still my desk, but now there's some Star Wars creatures standing on I, my desk and fighting each other, like, a, like on the Millennium that. Falcon, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I, when I first saw that, the first line that came into my mind was that that one, that that classic line from Star Wars, where um, Princess Leia says, "Obi Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope," and, yes. and it just goes into that loop, right? And I still remember R two D two sitting there going, "That is just crazy stuff," you know. And here yeah. we are; we're actually at that point where this is real. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Only in that universe, you don't need the headset and all that stuff, you know. Here, we still need. <laughs> We still need to put on the headgear in order to see that. But, you know, you think about those, like, not only from the entertainment and educational aspects of it, but yeah. even for mm -hmm. the, you know, just helping impaired individuals that wouldn't ordinarily not be able to get to certain, get to do certain things. Yeah. Now they could, they could do them virtually and go places exactly. virtually, you know, even mm -hmm. if they can't per se, you know, leave their house per se. It's just, you know, the mind boggles yeah. at all the different things that you could do. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, there's, there's the potential for this is quite fascinating. Uh, you know, in medical, there's a lot of potential there. Um, and um, obviously, in travel and tourism, it's, it's already been used a lot. I mean, mm -hmm. it's actually, in fact, actually, you could probably argue that in the real estate and commercial real estate world, which is really the same space that I'm actually in, um, is in fact where it really took off and where it still is probably at its strongest. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can doing a, 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 a tour of a, of a golf course, you know, yeah. before you go and play, that you know, kind of a thing. Those types yeah. of things. You know, it's, it's all kinds very, of all kinds of things like that. And we were, I was talking to someone the other day. Maybe it was on a show, but we were talking about uh, the different uses of VR beyond entertainment and games and and those sorts of things. But when you think about like therapy. Mm -hmm. sit down virtually with a therapist or your doctor mm -hmm. and explain face to face and get have that sort of presence that you're actually with another human being even though this human being may happen to be in New York and you're in San Francisco you can mm -hmm. still have that kind of experience without getting on a plane and burning fossil fuels exactly right? Exactly. Yeah. And that's, yeah. Exactly. No, that, that, that's very much where I see the future of VR as a as a as a generic term, which mm -hmm. is an interesting point too. Because just uh, this past week, I think I mentioned to you before when we were chatting last week that there was a large conference, um, you know, called um, it, it's an organization called the IVRPA, which is the International Virtual Reality Photographers Association, and they're actually debating about changing the P to no longer mean photography but professionals association because it's not just photography it you know a lot of these guys that are a part of the association are actually more involved in the the video aspect of it so there's mm -hmm. all these little niches and every one of them it, once you go down that rabbit hole it's it's a hard way to get back out because it's just so deep you know yeah, yeah. um and but I, they their 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 discussions were having to do with where really is the the next level of 
of, of VR work going to be going to and who the next markets are going to be interested in it. Yeah, I can so, see yeah. in the science fiction world, uh, you know, and I'm copywriting this right now, Hollywood, you know, in the, <laughs> in the science, the science fiction, I'm just kidding, please do this. If you want. Um, in the science fiction world, imagine, or in the future world, imagine a world when, you know, the, the VR becomes as commonplace as, say, uh, you know, the old wall-mounted telephone was. Mm -hmm. Remember, everyone had mm -hmm. a phone in their house and, you know, you want to go make a call, you had to run downstairs to the kitchen and dial to make a phone I'm, That's it. Phone call. I'm thinking in the future, what if there's like a VR little closet type room, soundproof mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. that when you want to do these VR type telepresence things, whether it be for entertainment, meeting with friends, meeting with your doctor, whatever, mm -hmm. you go into this room that's part of your home, close the door, yeah. put on your gear, sit down, stand up, whatever, and that's now it. you're transported to this different spot on the planet and it feels very real. Wouldn't exactly. that be great? It's, yeah. uh, it is, and, you know, and it actually, and, and so there's obviously, you know, people out there who are quite fearful of this stuff, you know, who, who go, uh, geez, you know, I don't, this is, this is just cross the line. And in fact, there are times and places when you could think that that may be the case. It comes down in to, way, though, like, in like, oh, what well, way would it cross the line <laughs> in terms of, like, removing, removing humans from the, the human contact, you know, like, saying, okay. there is that. Yeah, yeah it's, I, I had a conversation with a, actually it's a fellow who's my next door neighbor, he, he, and he's a fabulous, fabulous. He's one of Australia's greatest photographers, truly. If you haven't seen uh, Ken Duncan's work, uh, check out Ken Duncan. He is amazing. And I dropped in to see him, just have a bit of a chat. And he says he and his wife Pam were looking at, at at using VR headsets. And he says he says you know what he can imagine himself with his wife sitting on the sofa going. How's it going, dear? You know, and you're in your own little world, you know. Yeah, and right. and there's a truth that where you can end up in a disconnect. And I agree with that as a challenge. Yeah. It doesn't mean it's the only thing. And it's that whole idea of use it when it's appropriate. Use it sure. when it's not. And Absolutely. don't use it when it's not appropriate. You know. Yeah, like Google Glass, right? It was the same. Yeah. <laughs> it was the same kind yeah. of thing. But I mean, to argue that point of you know, you're sitting on the couch with your significant other and you're both yeah. wearing. Well, first of all, I don't think I would ever be sitting on the couch wearing a VR headset with my girlfriend. <laughs> 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 never say never, but yeah. I'm thinking that you know that's what's the difference between now you're sitting in the living room and everyone's on their phone either texting on Facebook or candy mm -hmm. crushing or angry birding yeah. or whatever, right? You're yeah. still disconnected. Your attention is on that that's device, it. but that's yeah, I, I I see the point of now you're you're mm. you know you have a you have a bowling ball on your head and no one can see you. <laughs> and you know I actually uh, Frederick I think the most important thing for us to think in terms of where the future of the, uh, of the VR virtual tours uh, 360 imagery is really going is more that these are all the necessary baby steps just like the early days of photography where um, you know it, it, everything took a long time to create and everything was black and white so suddenly color came out my goodness what a change that was yeah. When we get to the point when the experience no longer requires things you wear, that's the line to me when the whole VR experience will actually have totally mat agree. matured. Yeah. So, but if you have to wear something, uh, I don't even care if it's a if it's a uh, a watch. Like to me, I don't wear. I haven't worn a watch in forever, and I look at the people who wear these I these I watch. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I know you love yours too. I just for me, it's like take everything that's that you wear off, other than the stuff you like glasses. So like we were talking earlier, I don't have my glasses on today. But you you yeah. know, when you're not wearing those things, you feel like you're more connected with the reality of the space that you're yeah. in. No, I, I um, completely agree. I completely agree. You know, and the, on a on a different tangent with all this stuff is is uh, voice response systems, which mm -hmm. overlay nicely into this VR world. You know, like we have the the Amazon Echo um, mm -hmm. and this next generation of Siri, and Google is is moving forward with their voice recognition and response systems. When which which they say, you know, some of the articles say that that's the next wave of how we're going to interact with our with our computers is just having voice everywhere. I mean, it's kind of here now in a lot of ways with Siri and, and the Amazon Alexa. It's in your car. Some cars have voice recognition and all that, yeah, but yeah. it's all kind of early. Mm -hmm. Now imagine, I think about this stuff and I imagine a world where we have these kind of VR experiences and then you overlay them with these ultra smart uh, virtual entities that you can access with your voice. So mm -hmm. now you're standing in a virtual world and you could say, Hey, uh, you know, what's the weather like in, in, you know, Australia or in, you know, in mm -hmm. Melbourne right now? And, exactly. 
yeah. instead of it just get, giving you a voice response, it changes to Melbourne, wherever you're standing, and you can actually see what the weather's like with an overlay in the sky of what the actual temperature is. I'll, I'll tell you, it's funny that you say that because I'm actually being a you know, Google Street View photographer. Obviously, I use a lot of Google tools. And I'm now at the point where I don't use the hands-free built into the car for actually dialing when I'm I gotta call somebody, I'm like staying on hands-free. I just yeah. say, okay, Google. <laughs> right. And I you yeah. know, you know, call, you know, call Frederick Van Johnson and it'll just dial you as yeah. long as the number is in the system. And I it's so much better. It's the the voice recognition quality that they've put together is just fabulous, which is all part yeah. of that whole yeah. VR experience because if you can actually call up the imagery. If you can call up the content, you know, that's where we're, we're, we're these are exciting times. They really are. For, it for, is. For it's, like, yeah. it's like, you, you remember a minority report with Tom Cruise, yeah. you know, where he's yeah. like, the things are floating in the air and he's throwing things around and screens and all that. We're even beyond that because yeah. now we're thinking, you know, the whole being, having to, to interact with something in the air that's so like, you know, 2020, mm. you should just be able it to is. talk. <laughs> yeah. <It's> just, <laughs> Talk and have it show up. Like, show yeah. me all the records for Mark. You know, brrr, and yeah. I get all the records there. You exactly. Know? Exactly. Yeah. So, no, that's really yeah. what it is. Yeah. I think, Mark. Mark, I think we were born too early. I think that's the problem. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The gray hairs on my chin, you know. <laughs> I know, I know. We're born too early, you know. Hopefully, in our lifetime, we'll see a mm. mission to Mars, and you know, we'll we'll solve mm. some of the issues that are that are facing mankind today. But on the positive mm. side, you see all these advances, and mm -hmm. you know, the self-driving cars and voice-activated this and drones, and it's just yeah. you know, I feel like every day we're inching closer to that you know, that, that science fiction world that we always want to live in as kids. Yeah. yeah, it's it's actually, you mentioned drones, because I know you've loved, you loved your drones. And I was flying you, yesterday. You, you, you were fly well, actually, I, for the first time yesterday, helped out a mate of mine who I've actually done some some work with, who's, who runs a drone company, David Inwood, he, and he, uh, he runs a company called Bravo Drones here on the Central Coast, and we were doing a test flight uh, over the Gosford, uh, Brisbane Waters, which is Gosford, the little town here. Mm -hmm. And man, I'll tell you, there's a lot to learn. That is complicated stuff. I mean, I hats off to anybody who can actually fly and take pictures at the same time. Like that's yeah. that's pretty full on, you know. It, yeah, it's 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 not trivial, but it's it, at the same time compared to where things were, you know, say a couple yeah. of years ago, were leaps and bounds. You know, and people think, you know, as things get as as, as technology advances, things get more complex. But really, it's the opposite. As technology advances, things get easier. Because yeah. now drones, like, you know, the Phantom 3, which mm -hmm. is the one I have, is, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's relatively easy to fly. You know, if you let go of the sticks, the thing will just hover. You know, it's not it like does. you have to, it's not like you're flying a real helicopter where you have to be present at all times. You That's know, this it. thing, it'll just hover. You can go forward. You can even program its flight path, and it'll do that. But now yeah. we have the Phantom 4, which mm -hmm. has object and, you know, object and collision uh -huh. avoidance. So it's smart. Yeah. It will see a wall and not hit it and try to go around it intelligently. Well, you know, I'll tell you something. This is something that David said yesterday. He says, because we talked about the Phantom 4, mm -hmm. um, and he was saying the one thing is, is it's really good at things in front of it, but it has a really hard time with this stuff on either it side. Have <laughs> so, <vision>. <laughs> so he says, it's good. But you still got to know what you're doing, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So it's like a bad driver in L.A. You can see in front of them, but they can't <laughs> see to the left or to the right. <laughs> oh, yeah, only so much, you know? So, yeah, in fact, actually, yeah, and he, because he, he was he was actually doing the, this 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 flight, and there's a, a football stadium that he was actually taking some shots of quite high up. And he actually does 360s, by the way, too. And this is one of the things that's fabulous with, uh, with um, um, software programs like uh, PT GUI, which is the software I use for doing the stitching of the imagery. Uh, and there's other ones, there's Autopano Giga and Easy Panel and all these programs, but PT GUI is probably the best known one. And I introduced him to the idea of using that for doing uh, 360 imagery, you know, in the ultimate tripod in the air. Oh, that'd be um, so cool, yeah. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I think about what you're doing and I think, I just, just, Go take a whole lot of shots all the way around. You'll need to take quite a few, obviously, because your your field of view is probably what is it about a little seventy degrees, eighty degrees? Yeah, yeah, so roughly. Yep. Yeah, so that means that your overlap, you're, you're going to be taking you know a hell of a lot more than what I do. You know, I, I take four images on a on a fisheye lens, and that's plenty. Um, yeah. But you know, you actually you'll end up needing to take a lot more imagery to complete that full photosphere. 
Uh, and you know, the beauty too with um, you know with uh, um, having your your camera on the underside, the sky is the only thing above you. That's easily photoshopped. So if you really want to create that sphere effect, oh, that's so you true. Just, yeah, yeah. So all you do is basically just shot, you know, Photoshop in your sky, which is if it's a blue day, perfectly blue sky day. Blue is blue is blue, pretty well. You don't know a little yeah. blending, and away you go. But you can even do that on the ground, which, by the way, is what I wanted to point out to you. This because there's a lot of guys out there who, who will be into to, wanting to do this at a much higher quality because, you know, there's that whole thing of yeah, right. You're shooting with an eight mil lens. You know how much. You know how far can you really see with an eight mil lens? Well, you know you can get some pretty big images. You know, mm -hmm. my images when I'm finished with them are, are ten thousand by five thousand pixels. So they're big oh, images. Wow. Okay. Um, because it's a two to one ratio. An equirectangular. You know, if you think of the word equirectangular, it really does mean a two to one ratio image that's stretched out a little bit like the you know when you were a kid and you looked at the map and you mm -hmm. saw Greenland was really really big and Antarctica is really really big. Well, yeah. that's actually a good way to describe what an equirectangular is. It stretches the top and the bottom out in that way, so that when you wrap it back around, it makes it more normal when you look at right. it. So, right, right. That that's what the software does. The software software is going to take that equirectangular distorted image and undistorted yeah. it, Correct. and wrap it around you, so that as you look, you see relatively distortion-free imagery. Correct. Yeah, and where one of the issues that you'll run into, and this is a, a warning and a heads up to everyone who's shooting who wants to give this a go, because you know, like there's, you can buy uh, like the the Sigma lens is a good choice because you can get it in the in the uh, Canon or Nikon, and, and and if you're looking at you know in the Micro Four Thirds world, there's obviously companies like Samyang and uh, that do these things. Mm -hmm. um, but you'll notice that because, as you probably know, the you can get a lot of uh, chromatic aberration on the edges of a lens. Yeah. Be yeah. ready that you're going to have a lot of CA at the, on, on at the very top of the imagery and at the very bottom of the imagery. So you do struggle a bit with that in terms of when you're doing the processing. Sure. But sure. to avoid all that, if you really want to get heavy duty, if you really want to do the really big stuff, which is what John will do, John Warkington and, and guys like um, Les Moyle and these guys. Um, and Tony Redhead, he's also another guy who is a bit of a pioneer. Is you use something like this, which is this over here is um, I'll just unscrew this so you can see what it looks like. This oops, and I don't want to lose the parts. Um, this over here is called a Nodal Ninja Four, okay. which is a um, it, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a panoramic head designed to fix one major challenge in the world of 360 imagery, which is something called the parallax effect. Mm -hmm. Okay, because you know how whenever you if you put your hand over one eye and you look at an object and you put your hand on the other eye, it's not as if the object moved over. Yes, yeah, that's that, yeah, sure. that's that's parallax effect. Well, with one of these heads, what you're doing is because you're really mm -hmm. you know a, a camera is is a one eyed beast. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you're actually taking the image from a center point and making sure that the the center of the lens stays exactly dead center, and that prevents the parallax effect. And that okay. that dead center. Point is the nodal point. Is that correct? Is That's that correct. Nodal? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Or, yeah, exactly. And then what you all let, most likely end up wanting to have is what's this is actually the uh, the uh, the actual uh, nodal um, unit, which um, allows you to get exactly the number of spins you uh, spin images. For example, if you're shooting at twenty, I, I was just uh, I did a, a spin with my uh, twenty four to seventy lens on a crop sensor, and so at twenty four mil, I was shooting every twenty degrees. So that means you're going to end up with a heck of a lot of images, and right. then you sh and then you actually shoot probably 30 degrees down, 30 degrees up, and so that you and then you'll and you'll take a shot which is what's called the zenith, which is right above you, and then the nadir shot, and you can stitch all that. And PTGU is a software that will actually allow you to stitch all those images and together. And when you throw all those images at at PTGUI, do you have mm -hmm. to like number them sequentially, or do you just throw them in? You throw them at the the app, and it just figures out what you want and pops out with goodness on the other side. Well, almost. <laughs> it does a really, really good job of uh, of basically getting all the, the 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 alignment of each image and the overlap uh, to to fit quite well, as long as you didn't move your camera much. So obviously, this is always tripod shooting. You don't do you, you can shoot off of a tripod, but you know the chances of your stitches being really good or it, you know, it drops relative to that. I always shoot on the tripod. But when PT Google is through, will go through the image, it'll actually stitch it reasonably well. But you'll always end up with bits and pieces that can cause problems. Yeah. The worst one, outdoors, clouds. Clouds move. And as oh, soon as right. you take the image and you turn again, it's like the cloud's gone a little further off to the left. It's like, 
<clears throat> you know, the, the software is trying to figure out what happened here because yeah. it's not lining up with the ground anymore, right? And it's trying to line everything up. Mm -hmm. So then you may end up having to say, no, 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 don't put dots on the clouds. <laughs> Take those dots out of there and just leave dots on things that don't move to create the imagery. So it's looking for... for so some for devil's dots. advocate, some people may be listening to this thinking, you know, all that sounds well and fine, but hey, I have an iPhone. It has a panorama yeah. mode on it. I can just stand in one spot and spin around, and I got the whole thing. Why do I have to buy this stuff and care about nodal points and, and yep. PT GUI and all that? What do you say to those I, guys? I say, you know what? If, if you don't mind your images going all crooked and all <laughs> funnily stitched, it, it's where you notice it the most is um, um, for if you actually have a 360 that's done by the ocean. Okay, mm -hmm. and you see a wave, and then you see that half a wave is gone, yeah. <laughs> and then it continues right. down. So it does actually cause some issues when it comes to that. You, you, you're really not able to blend the image if, uh, correctly. You're also not able to shoot in RAW, so you can't get your color. Your, your, um, one of the biggest challenges I mentioned earlier on is if you're actually doing an image that's on the edge of the, in, uh, of the front door of a business or an entrance area, you're looking inside and outside at the same time. You know, that's, that's hell when it comes to trying to get your white balance right. Right, so, right, yeah. So uh, if you're not shooting it raw and able to correct manually, uh, you're just not going to get a very good looking image. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, so that's really what it comes down to is, is thinking in terms of it's a quality issue. So there's, again, you know, separating those who want to do it just for fun. If you want to do it for fun, just get one of these. Yeah. Seriously, yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah, the theta S. If you want to get serious with it, uh, hey, um, right now, um, I know that um, um, John Warkington is actually shooting with a 5DSR with, yeah. a, um, with a, um, the Canon 8-15 to set at about 12 or 13 millimeters and doing spins with that. You can imagine how wonderful those are going to look, right? What about, so. what about some of the companies that are coming out? Like Nikon, for example, has announced, they haven't shipped it yet, obviously, or announced pricing, mm -hmm. but they have this yeah. product called the Key Mission 360. It's coming, yeah. and it's supposed to be like the competitor to the to the Theta S, so and it's mm -hmm. 4K video versus 1080, and yep. and ruggedized and all that stuff. Does does a, an all in one product like that excite you? Or do it you, does it, yeah? absolutely, absolutely. Again, it, it what it does is it, it's just it, it's another tool, and it, keeping in mind that even one of these tools will actually have. They have their plateau where they just max out in terms of what they can do for you, yeah. and it's just knowing not to exceed that plateau and using it appropriately for that for that purpose. You know, if, if you, all you want to do is uh, you're, you're going kayaking and you want to take a couple of quick shots, or you want to have a 360. You know, like you can do it very quickly if you just want to go along by yourself. If you want to hire a photographer who follows you with a follow me drone doing 360s behind you, yeah. you know, well then you're going to have to pay for that service. Yeah, it's so it really much, is much an issue. Yeah, yeah. It, it depends so, on the gig. But the yeah. thing that excited me about the about the Key Mission 360 is that 4K video versus yeah. the Theta S video because the video out of the Theta S, yeah. the 360 video is, yeah, it's not really usable from a professional standpoint. It's a good wow. demonstration of the technology, and it's kind of ooh ah, yeah. look at all that. But yeah. final video, it's kind of it's low res because yeah. it is taking that equi equi rectangular video and mm -hmm. stretching that out and doing all sorts of math to it so you don't actually get 1080 mm -hmm. when you're looking at that. It's not, it's not true 1080. Yeah. And I'm hoping with the Key Mission 360 or cameras that shoot or whatever, we'll get closer mm -hmm. to you know, actual HD resolution on a, on a 360 pano. You, think, you, yeah, you, think, exactly. you think we're going in that direction now? I I, I'm sure that we are. I'm sure that this is where it's going. In fact, just last night I was watching a video uh, that Google put out a few months ago, which is a tour, uh, a 360 video virtual tour of uh, one of their big, uh, one of their big uh, data centers, and it was quite fascinating. And yet, you know, here's Google, which is like you know the great big monster of, of the industry. And of course, being the techie kind of guy that I am and a photographer, he's like, I'm looking for all the stitching errors. <laughs> And sure enough, I'm finding them everywhere. So even they are not quite there with content that they're creating. And, you know, that was done two months ago. Wow. So, well, well, that's an so opportunity, though. That's, that's, that's an opportunity. Yeah. 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 That's an opportunity. Get in there now. It's still early. And mm -hmm. it's still the Wild West in terms of what the different business models that are going to flesh out and, and all yeah. the different tangents. You know, everything from 360, external, internal, aerial, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. everything, all these different things are, are coming along. So, and now is the time to jump in and not be the guy or woman mm-hmm. three years from now that says, wow, back in 2016, I had this mm-hmm. idea and I never executed on it. You absolutely, know? absolutely. Okay. This is really the key time, which is why I, I got so excited about doing this is that I could see where the future was going with it. Um, it, it, it and there is going to be a, a, a shelf life of each level of the technology. So mm-hmm. it's important to get on early enough, as much as you possibly can. Not that you can't learn it, but it's no different than, you know, I, I haven't been shooting as long as you have professionally, you know. And mm-hmm. so, you know, I can't pick up those 20 or 30 years that someone else has done. So, yeah, you, yeah. and that's normal. And that's okay. So as long as you understand that where you're starting from, pick a, a niche that's actually going to have some, some life in it. Yeah. And 360 yeah. is fabulous for that right now. Love it. Mark, yeah. where, where should people go to look, look at some of the work that you, you have going on? And maybe even if they're in your area, hire you to mm-hmm. do some work. Um, actually, the easiest way is to go to my website, which is workpix360 or workpix.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, so just W-O-R-K-P-I-C-S.com. I've got a lot of samples there. I, I will warn people that I'm in the pro. I've just handed over the reins of my website to uh, some fellows to actually do it on WordPress because I had built my own website and I just... I got other things to do. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm handing over that job to someone else. So it's actually going to go through probably a, a couple of days of being down and back up again. Uh, but definitely that's the easiest way or just email me at mark, M-A-R-C, at workpicks.com. Easy. Mark, thanks a lot for taking the time today. You've got me excited about taking my theta out again and doing some shots. So I may actually, yeah. I may actually do that experiment that I've been threatening to do like your friend did and, and mm. strap my theta to the bottom of my, my phantom and go do yeah. some aerial 360s. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, we actually did that, and uh, and we, we we had a bit of a failure. And just as a heads up, we're thinking, yeah, quite, yeah what happened? I think that there, um, because of when you're actually trying to shoot with the theta, the it's using Wi-Fi, and I think we were getting interference from the radio transmission from the from the either the controller oh, or, yeah. or or the or the toy in the sky. We're not sure which one it was, so yeah. we got to go back and redo this again. So heads up. And the other thing, too, is make sure that you've got plenty of ground clearance <laughs> so that when you go to land the thing, you don't smash it into the ground. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, I'm, I'm the cool guy that lands in my hand now, so I grab it out of the oh. air. I get, you know, I've been yeah. practicing. <laughs> Colin Smith does that. Colin Smith does that all the time, and he's like, you know, great. It looks so cool to just yeah. grab it and walk away. Uh, yeah, but just, it's the take off piece where you know it's going to have to be like on cinder blocks or something, and with the with the camera hanging beneath. So. You know, there's one guy I don't want to see do that. Jared Poland was, without that hair. I just could you just imagine if he just got a little oh, too yeah. close? <laughs> that could that could end badly for Jared. Yeah, that could. Yeah, uh, yeah. Maybe he's what I was. Mm, yeah, maybe just land it on the ground. <laughs> we have somebody else grab it for you. Yeah. Well, cool, okay, man. We'll, cool. we'll we'll direct people over there to workpicks.com. Good luck in all that you're you're working on, and and I want to invite you to come on this week in photo as a guest from time to time. I think you'd add some some good a good 360 perspective to the overall conversation. That'd be wonderful. Really appreciate that very much. Thank you very much. All right, Mark. You have a good one. All right. Take care. Bye for now.